Alrighty. Well, welcome to our first webinar of 2021, Nuclear Histories, How the Atom Shapes the Past. The Deep Conversations History, Environment and Science series is a collaboration between the Research Centre for Deep History and the Centre for Environmental History here at the Australian National University. I'm Ruth Morgan and my co-host this afternoon is Dr. Laura Rademacher. But before I introduce our discussants, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples on whose unceded lands the ANU stands. I'm coming to you from Dharawal country today and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you are all working today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in our webinar today. I pay my respects to elders past and present and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to country. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Pacific peoples whose lands and waters, the extraction of radioactive ores and the testing of atomic weapons has taken place. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Today's deep conversation on nuclear histories brings together insights from historians and scientists working on how the atom shapes and shares our histories as well as its lasting human and environmental legacies in the 21st century. Each of our speakers will have about 12 to 15 minutes on the floor, and then we'll follow up with about half an hour of questions from all of you. First up, we have Professor Emerita Heather Goodall, who's a historian from the University of Technology, Sydney, who has worked closely on Indigenous histories with Indigenous communities and individuals in both collaborative and academic settings. Living in Ernabella on the Pitandara freehold lands in South Australia in the mid-1980s, Heather was approached by the Pitandara Council to assist in the research for their legal team, which was presenting their case into the McClelland Royal Commission on British Nuclear Testing in Australia. Then we move to Jess Irwin, a PhD candidate here in the School of History at ANU, where she is working on the history of nuclear colonialism in South Australia since the turn of the 20th century. And then we turn to our guest from the sciences, Dr. Floriana Salvamini, a, a scientist at the Australian Centre for Neutron Scattering at the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, where she is the coordinator of the Cultural Heritage Scientific Research Program. And last but not least, we have Dr. Julia Carpenter, a senior scientist at the Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency, where she leads a team responsible for assessing the health and environmental impacts of radiation exposures. She's also the Australian representative on the International Atomic Energies Agency's Waste Standards Committee and a member of the Alligator Rivers Region Technical Committee. So without further ado, over to you, Heather. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruth. Um, it's nice to be here, although it's really strange not to be able to see any of the people who are participating, other than my fellow panellists, which is a great delight. Um, now, Laura has just is just about to share my screen, and that's the end of it. So Laura will zip through to the beginning, and um, there we are. There's the beginning yeah. of it. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking to you about the work that I was doing um, in Central Australia, but I'm speaking to you from Glebe. I'm on Wongal Wongal land um, in, in, in the area of uh, Darak language, and I'm going to be talking to you about the perspectives we can take on the testing that took place on these, uh, in this Central Australian area in the 1950s. Um, and, and I'm suggesting that we need to take broader perspectives than simply to look at the tests. So I want to talk to you about three perspectives today. The first one um, will focus on the tests themselves. Uh, the second one and the third ones are, are broader perspectives, which I'm going to suggest help us to understand the impacts. Now I'm looking at the impacts on Indigenous peoples, specifically on Pitindjatjara and Yankunjatjara people who live in, in these areas where the testing occurred. Now, um, the, this map here shows you the, um, the Monte Bellows where the first tests took place, and that's a whole different mob of people. I'm not really uh, discussing those people at all. This was a test, big test, which took place on an island off uh, the Pilbara, and it was um, a fission explosion. All of the explosions, the formerly called explosions in Australia, were fission. They were A-bomb explosions, although in fact there was an awful lot of experimentation, um, which I'm sure we'll hear about later on. So um, 
the two I'm going to be talking about, particularly the, well, both of the, the groups, this EMU field and this perspective allows us to actually look at the, at the maps and see where these tests took place and when. There were two tests um, at EMU field, which is a little to the northeast of the area that most of us know about, know about Maralinga, where most of the tests took place. So the EMU field tests are in 1953. The Maralinga tests start in 1956 um, and there's further tests until the uh, nuclear test ban treaty in 1963. The big blasts are in 1956 and 57. They're called blasts and they're known as blasts. I realise Maggie Brady's there in the audience and Maggie will know a lot more about this than me. So I'm hoping that Maggie's comments will uh, and questions will arise at the end. But there were a number of these things called minor trials after 1957, when it was becoming harder and harder to have above ground explosions without a lot of condemnation. And so some of those explosions, which were called minor trials, including the one called Kittens, the group called Kittens, uh, were in fact exceedingly polluting. And I'm sure we'll hear quite a lot about the um, the waste which was left after those explosions and only partially cleaned up um, at the end of the British occupation in 67 and uh, <clears throat> uh, later on at the end of the Royal Commission into British nuclear testing. Now this perspective allows us to ask some important questions about those tests and that's where we'll go to the next slide Laura. Bingo, okay. Um, now, those, particularly the EMU tests, those 1953 ones, are the ones where there is really very grave concern, particularly the first test, the one in October 1953. Ray Acaster, who was the meteorologist um, for the weapons range establishment at that time, um, was was deeply concerned about this. So to give you some background, this is after the Second World War. This is a period when the, uh, the British were recognizing that they had lost uh, global leadership to the United States and they were desperately clawing their way back. And one of the ways they hoped to do this was by exploding, uh, demonstrating that they had mastered atomic technology. Now, the EMU tests had already been delayed twice by the time the first totem blast was supposed to be set off in October. And the British were deeply unhappy about having to delay one more time. But Acaster, the meteorologist, was aware that um, if you think about the, the air above us, um, there are layers, convection layers in that air. Most days, the direction of the wind in those convection layers will be in different directions. So anything that happens like smoke will be dispersed. Ray Acaster pointed out that on that day, the 15th of October, the wind directions in all of the, <coughs> sorry, convection boundary layers were heading in the same direction and they were heading directly northeast um, and they would go over areas which were known to be inhabited. Um, these were the Yankundajara areas um, of Wallatina, um, an Aboriginal community in a pastoral property on which there was a large Aboriginal community living, the Mintaby Opal Field, Malabar uh, Roadhouse and Wellborn Station were all going to be in the path of the, uh, the radioactive cloud from this first explosion. The British uh, weapons range establishment rejected Acaster's advice because it was it would have been embarrassing to delay the test one more time. So the test went ahead <clears throat> and um, the, the, because there had been no baseline studies, nobody knew what the condition of any of the people, certainly not the Aboriginal people was, prior to that test being fired. And so all we have is oral history evidence about a low dark cloud rolling through at tree level and of people becoming sick afterwards. And that's um, a, an oral narrative which persisted and occurred in the other places which were overcome um, and in that direction as well. <clears throat> Yummy Lester wrote an autobiography. He was one of the people at Wallatina. He talked about this a lot. 
over the years and his autobiography gives a little bit of time to it. He became a key leader in that area and his words were taken very seriously. And it was his testimony as well as those of other people in the Wallatina area, which really generated the calls for a Royal Commission, <clears throat> which was occurring, set up in uh, the early 1980s, 82, 83. Um, this first photo is Yummy speaking at the handback of Uluru, which was a really major and important event in 1985. By this stage, the Royal Commission had reported and um, had, had uh, brought its conclusions, which were that it was difficult to identify precise damage that had been done by these nuclear explosions because there had been no baseline studies. These were relatively small populations, so statistically it was hard to pin blame on it, <clears throat> on, on any of the, the testing or on any other cause. But it's quite clear that there was some phenomenon which rolled right across these, these small communities. Um, Yummy continued to speak out about this, and this is a lovely portrait that uh, Juno Gems took of Yummy in his later years. And of course, I'm apologizing to indigenous peoples watching this who will be concerned about somebody who's passed away and Yami has passed away. But his, his words were so important and he himself um, expected that his words and his images would continue after his death to be used to advance the, the knowledge about the impact of that testing. Now, um, Ray Acaster, wasn't satisfied. So we just keep on this for one more minute. Ray Acaster wrote about this later on. Now the legal team that was researching in 1984-85 discovered Acaster's attempt to stop the blast going ahead in October um, in the British archives. But um, he himself hadn't written about it until much later on. But he wrote an article in Limina in 1995, and then he discovered the Oral History Journal, um, uh, journal, Oral History Association of Australia Journal, and he wrote extensively about the way the Indigenous oral history, the Pindijara, Yan Kundijara oral history, confirmed precisely what he had expected would happen, and in fact filled out further details about the behaviour of the radioactive cloud. So Acaster, but particularly the oral histories of Yummy and others, were extremely important in exposing the damage that was done. And one of the important indications of why that damage was done, why there had been no baseline studies, was um, an indication that was given. <clears throat> Walter McDougall was a patrol officer, uh, the only one for a long time, who was employed by the weapons range establishment to um, <clears throat> to argue with Aboriginal people to convince them not to go near the uh, the testing sites. He wasn't employed to get a baseline study uh, and he wasn't able to do that, but he advocated on behalf of Aboriginal people um, and, and attempted to protect them from the damage as he understood it. But he was told by the chief scientist that in doing this attempt to defend Aboriginal people's interests, he was placing the affairs of a handful of natives above those of the British Commonwealth of Nations. It was that, um, it was that contempt, it was that negligence which pervaded the whole weapons range establishment and led to this failure to either anticipate or to protect the people who were in the path of the radiation. Now we can go to the next perspective, Laura and I won't have too much time left, so I'll do this fairly quickly. <clears throat> Another perspective asks us, I think, to look more broadly and to do a comparison between the testing sites in Australia, which you can see in that map as red, and some of the other places where nuclear weapons were tested, like the close place where the United States was testing, and we can do the first click now, Laura, Bikini Atoll. Just click and you will see, yes, Bikini Atoll. This is the Marshall Islands group. The United States had been testing fission uh, A-bombs there from 1946. And you can see it's a long way out in the Pacific Ocean. 
but the people on the Bikini Atoll were removed. They were displaced and they were never able to go back. Now, the, 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 one, the reason we know the name Bikini was that in 1954, the United States exploded its second thermonuclear, its, its fusion device. Um, and it was a, a wildly a wider impact than had been expected. There was a far greater yield and a far greater impact to the extent that greater area was irradiated and the crew on a Japanese fishing boat, the Lucky Dragon, were injured. One of them died, the rest of them were in hospital for months and months in Japan. So Bikini Atoll brought the dangers of nuclear testing to the world. The British weren't um, and, and chose not to uh, undertake fusion testing in Australia, but they went to Christmas Island. Now um, in the Kiribati, um, over here you can see in 1957, the British began their uh, fusion program of testing H-bombs on uh, Christmas Island. Kirimati is the way it's spelt, Christmas is the way it's pronounced. However, we have a wider range where we can, um, we can look, but I might just point out that the people in Christmas Island had to be moved too. They were displaced. They were people who belonged to that country and they were displaced. But where was the first testing carried out? Uh, next click, Laura. Nevada, um, New Mexico. These are the lands of the Navajo and the Hopi people. So these people also were moved um, out of the testing grounds and um, were kept out for long periods of time. And our final click, our second last click, um, is we can think about those places like China, which were late in the, the testing program. Um, in 1964, China was testing. Where were they testing? In Xinjiang, um, the area where Uyghur people had a secure living space at that stage. All of the people here and the final click will give us uh, a summary of this. In each of these places, people were displaced. They were moved off their lands or off the lands where they had security. They were all people who were disempowered. Many of them were indigenous colonized people. Other people were uh, powerless people who'd been marginalized by the society in which they were living, um, like the Uyghurs. So in each place, people were not only pushed away from their lands, but their connection with that land was damaged. For indigenous people in many areas, they talk about losing language, about losing culture, about losing access to their country, losing the potential to be able to care for it. Final perspective, um, the last click, um, is to think that last, the second perspective I was suggesting looking more widely geographically. This perspective, I think we can look um, more widely in time. How much time have I got, Laura? Speaking of time? One minute. Okay, I'll be really fast. Um, I was living at Ernabella. You can give the first click now. Ernabella is to the northwest of that emu testing site, and it's much further uh, north of the Maralinga test site, which was established in 1956. Now, Ernabella, um, as, as we've said, if we think longer in time, we know that bombs weren't going off until 1952 at the Montebellos. And so why would, we, why would we be looking any more widely than that? And initially we weren't. Uh, we were limiting our perspectives to the actual testing, although of course there were rockets which were being set off after 1946 from uh, Woomera, um, but they didn't have warheads on them. However, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, a viral pandemic, so all of you are much better informed about viral pandemics and epidemics than, than we were as first world researchers in 1984 when I was doing this research. What does a virus need to spread? People. It needs people. Somebody has to be infected for that virus to spread. Now this is a really important aspect of thinking longer in time. We can do the next click now, Laura. Um, and I want to suggest back, anyway, I want to suggest that Alfred Crosby is an important author that we should be thinking about. 
he wrote a book called Ecological Imperialism, The Biological Expansion of Europe. And he talked about the way that uh, viruses and bacteria were brought by colonizers and they began to infect colonized peoples around the globe as well as other biological impacts. Now that was all over in 1800, wasn't it? We know about the terrible viral and smallpox uh, epidemics, the bacterial and viral epidemics around the coastal areas of Australia. However, have a look at that map of the topography of Australia. Um, there's a lot of areas that are, are coloured a nice green in this, but we all know that in fact, if you look at the words, you're looking at desert in the whole of central Australia. There was a very, very low population once you moved away from the coast. There were not enough people for the virus to spread. And so the process of this um, biological invasion of Australia was a very, very slow one. It was even slower than the invasion of people. When did Alice Springs become a centre which was large enough to have a population of children who might be picking at, and you know getting the virus um, cyclically? Not really until the 1940s. And it was there was a railway line which had been completed in 1929. The depression had uh, meant that uh, population growth was slow. Second World War still impeded population growth, but by by the mid 40s, you had enough um, of, a, of a, a settled non-Aboriginal population in Alice Springs to have kids getting measles. Now, what happened was that you had people going up in um, along that railway line um, to Alice Springs carrying measles and Aboriginal drovers were infected at Udnadatta at the railhead. Now, um, at this stage, I might just point out that in 1985, first world researchers like me knew very little about measles because in Australia, because there is herd immunity among the non-Aboriginal population on the coast, um, it's, it's, a, it's a mild disease. But in even as late as 2019, even with a vaccine, which came after 1963, there are many thousands of people dying. In fact, before the vaccine, there were 2.6 million people who died every year from measles. So if measles is taking a long time to spread across the Australian continent, as it did, it is no surprise, um, and our final click, that in 1948, there was a measles epidemic at Urnabella, carried by those drovers from the rail line, which killed one, thought, one quarter to one third of the population in just a few weeks. We have descriptions of this from a nursing sister who was at Urnabella by Dr. Charles Duguid, who uh, rushed to try and get up there when he heard the epidemic had taken hold. Um, and it had, it, it turned into uh, pneumonia, intense diarrhea and dehydration. And it had lasting effects on the immune systems of survivors. It was a major and terrible tragedy. Um, which as researchers, we really weren't interested in. We were just interested in uh, nuclear weapons and testing. And it, it took us a long time to begin to ask questions and to think about the wider perspectives of the illnesses people had been facing and that colonialism had been brought, had, had brought into that area just a lot more slowly. Final click and Laura, we can just click right through all of these conclusions so that you can have a look the conclusions we can draw from taking three perspectives are that certainly some groups were subject to irradiation. It's very hard to tell statistically because of those very small numbers, but it seems un unquestionable that irradiation was a, a, a danger and a, a likely damage to those people in that northeastern cause. But other damage can be seen if we look comparatively at those testing locations. We can see that disempowered people suffered a great many losses. And finally, we can see that this set of waves of other illnesses had both impaired people's resistance to further illnesses, but also that it had marginalized terrible tragedies that really deserved to be grieved and mourned and recognized. So 
all of those things give us um, a, a bigger picture, I think, of the impact of, um, of atomic testing, nuclear testing in Australia. And I'll finish there. Thank you. Over to you, Jess. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that. Uh, so first I wanted to thank uh, uh, Ruth and Laura for organizing this. It's fantastic to be involved and um, with such an incredible um, lineup of people as well. And I also wanted to acknowledge the traditional lands um, of those on which I work here at the ANU and it's because of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and their custodianship of this land that we're able to work here. And I wanted to kind of start by um, pointing to the end of Heather's talk about this idea of expanding scope and thinking longer in time because um, I decided that perhaps the best way uh, to go today is that I, I knew Heather would talk about her experiences um, researching as part of the Royal Commission so that perhaps I would take a little bit of a different perspective today. Um, in asking how the atom shapes the past, it was really hard to narrow down exactly what I was going to talk about or how I was going to address that question, especially as Australia's nuclear history exists on several temporal scales, shaping the past in a plethora of ways. For example, as raw materials, radium and uranium have existed in Australia's environment for millennia. Importantly, Aboriginal histories do account for this, telling stories about radioactivity that significantly predate its discovery by European settlers, indicating deep historical origins. Yet the nuclear history that many have found interest in over the years purports to begin around 1945 uh, with the nuclear age presented as an historical epoch seemingly thrust upon us by the explosive discoveries of the Manhattan Project and the US's history altering decision to drop nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So in the time that I have today, I want to do two things. Firstly, I want to consider some of the links that the contemporary nuclear age has with earlier themes of discovery, scientific exploration and empire, touching upon some of the ways that the atom both shaped and was shaped by settler colonialism in Australia. And I then want to account for aspects of nuclear's deep history by making reference to two stories from Aboriginal communities about uh, nuclear material from their country. But first, the not so deep past. Australia's nuclear history importantly predates the apparent dawn of the nuclear age in Australia uh, when British nuclear tests took place during the 1950s and 60s in the central deserts, as Heather uh, has already spoken about. In fact, Australian newspapers demonstrated that there was an insatiable appetite for the nuclear even in the first years of the 20th century as scientific explorers and great scientific minds were taking center stage as heroes within the colonies as they sought to demonstrate the scientific relevance of the Australian co colonies and uncover uh, the continent's biological, anthropological, meteorological and mineralogical secrets. Archival material, some of which is seen here, dating from around 1905, demonstrates that radium and thus the nuclear was inextricably linked to the world of scientific exploration in Australia. But this was not just due to its new and novel discovery in the earliest 20th century, but by virtue to its interest and connection to one particular explorer, Douglas Mawson. Now, Douglas Mawson is usually known for his page turning adventures in the ice. Mawson is one of Australia's most famed explorers and has been described by some as the epitome of exploration scientific turn. But as a geologist by trade, Mawson showed particular interest in radioactivity, so much so that he aspired to exist among the ranks of famous uh, scientists of radioactivity, such as the Curies. And in 1906, three years after Marie Curie exposed the true wonders of radium, a prospector, Arthur Smith, came across a suspect ore deposit while searching for tin in the Flinders Ranges in South Australia. And when word broke that this material could be radioactive, Mawson was on the case, convincing the unassuming prospector to provide him with access to any ore uncovered at the site. 
Shortly after the discovery, Mawson established his own independent radium extraction company, which operated out of Adelaide and explored the expansive Flinders Ranges, uh, exploiting Aboriginal labour to uncover and transport radioactive ore. Now, the employment of an Aboriginal labourer, while not necessarily surprising, um, is indicative of a broader trend in nuclear history that radioactive materials are simultaneously considered a modern phenomena on the cutting edge of scientific development and still shaping a scientific epoch, while fundamentally relying upon colonial assumptions of scientific discovery that facilitated so much of European exploration of purportedly uncharted environments, or at least environments undocumented by Europeans. Thus, Mawson's scientific discoveries, both amongst the radioactive ore of the South Australian desert and in the Antarctic within the same decade, were rooted in a tradition of scientific discovery, both motivated and facilitated by colonising worldviews, propped up and funded by imperialistic and nationalistic goals. In the case of Antarctica, Mawson made it very clear that he felt the Australasian Antarctic expedition would provide an opportunity to prove that the young men of a young country could rise to those traditions which have made the history of British polar exploration. The exploration of Antarctica was considered a defining moment for Australian science, especially as the spirit of the man of science has quickened to a deeper fervour. And while the Australian Antarctic expedition was purported to be purely scientific, Mawson used it as an opportunity to cement the reputation of Australia in the South, especially as, as some historians have noted, such as Tom Griffiths, Mawson desired to secure the Antarctic as an extension of Australian territory, planting both the Australian and British flags upon his arrival. An Australian flag remains on the continent today. Occurring around the same time as Mawson's two trips to Antarctica, the discovery of radium in Australia also came at a time when a recently federated Australia was seeking its place among the world's scientific players. The scarcity of radium deposits the world over meant that the discovery of this material in Australia might just cement the place. Both in the ice and in the radium fields, Mawson was motivated by what Tom Griffiths described as a keen sense of Australia's distinct geopolitical interests. As explored by Martin Thomas and others, scientific expeditions of the 18th century assisted in fulfilling earlier imperial goals of discovering territory and peoples able to be incorporated into the empire. But the expeditions of Mawson and his contemporaries in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, such as the Horn uh, Scientific Expedition and the Elder Scientific Exploring Expedition seen on the screen here, and they represent a development of scientific expeditioning. The aim was no longer just to complete the map of Australia, as that task had been largely undertaken, but to utilise the professional expertise of scientists across a variety of disciplines to populate the maps of the recently federated state with its biological, anthropological, meteorological and mineralogical data. This data, much of which now belongs in Australian museums, could then be used to determine potential development opportunities, especially in the case of mineral deposits. And while we rarely think of nuclear substances as part of the history of scientific expeditioning, especially as we're saturated with histories of the atom post-dating the 1940s, Mawson's pursuit of radioactive materials was intimately entwined with a nationalistic desire to secure Australia's name in the global scientific community, thus consolidating the settler colonial triumph of who Mawson is purportedly said to have called the sons of the British Empire. Further to this, the early 20th century was a period when scientific discovery was shifting from being a purely imperial pursuit on behalf of the British Empire to being integral to the securing of settler colonialism and thus nationalism in Australia. Mining was, and in many instances remains, an important economic pursuit for both individual colonies and now states. The gold rushes of the late 1800s demonstrate the growth made possible by the discovery of mineral wealth. And when radium was discovered in nearly 50 years after the gold rushes in the Victorian gold fields, newspapers excitedly speculated as to the immense value that could be held by radium and thus the development that could be incurred in South Australia. The Adelaide Register referred to radium as priceless. The Argus gushed about its potential through discussion of its unique properties, while the Chronicle lauded the scientific development of those countries dabbling in early forms of nuclear science. <laughs> 
economically, militarily and scientifically, radium had the potential to hold great consequence for South Australia's development as a colony, cementing the settler colonial project in Australia. Thus, in searching for radium with the assistance of Aboriginal labour, Mawson and the substance he sought are vitally entwined in histories of knowledge gathering and discovery, processes fundamental to the consolidation of settler colonialism in 20th century Australia, but important, uh, importantly stemming from an earlier pedigree of adventurous and triumphant exploration by European men, a pedigree that existed centuries prior to the dawn of the nuclear age, yet vitally underpinned it. However, considering Australia's nuclear history, even in these kinds of contemporary terms, still overlooks the vital contribution of Aboriginal historical traditions, traditions that demonstrate that nuclear history in Australia has a deep past. While this topic is yet to be researched um, in any great depth, there are several notable examples of where Aboriginal histories of the land make reference to the toxic nature of radioactive materials and the consequences of mining them. One such example exists at Olympic Dam Uranium Mine in South Australia, a photograph of which was used on, on the poster for this event. Here, people opposed to the mine and its periodic expansion plans have formed a group called the Lizard's Revenge. Why? Well, because Olympic Dam is home to several vital Aboriginal dreamings, important to the Kukatha and Arabata peoples, among others. One of the stories told of the region is about a large lizard or culter who sleeps beneath the earth. Accounts of this lizard suggest that the radioactive material being extracted at Olympic Dam is actually from within the lizard. Communities who originate from around the mine site protest the extraction of minerals because they've always known not to disturb the lizard, but the mine has begun to wake it. Waking the lizard has had dire consequences for the environment and for those who come into contact with the extracted material, material that had been left to remain dormant by communities for millennia. Now, the radioactive nature of uranium and associated mine tailings concerns those communities traditionally responsible for the land by way of ancestral connection. And stories of this can be seen in Australia's north, in Kakadu National Park, where the Ranger uranium mine has only recently ceased operations. Here, the Mirar people have fought hard to contain the mine after their attempts uh, to argue down the government and mining companies were unfortunately squashed. In 2011, an earthquake and tsunami off the coast of Japan facilitated a nuclear disaster at the Fukushima power plant. Australia's Director General of the Australian Safeguards and Non-Proliferation Office within DFAT confirmed that, quote, Australian obligated nuclear material had been present at the site when the meltdown occurred. Members of the MIRA had already suspected that this might be the case and that uranium from their traditional lands had been involved. Traditional owner Yvonne Margarula wrote to the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon about her sorrow. She wrote, it is likely that the radiation problems at Fukushima are, at least in part, fueled by uranium derived from our traditional lands. This makes us very sad. Margarula's father, Toby Gungale, had been the Mirage spokesperson before her, and when negotiations were taking place in the 1970s with mining companies, he had warned the Australian government of a lethal power named Jung that would be unleashed if their lands were disturbed. Toby Gungale feared that Jung would kill all over the world, a reality then that his daughter, Yvonne Margarula, witnessed as news spread about the Fukushima disaster. As the stories of the deep past demonstrate, Aboriginal communities in Australia have been cognizant of the power of radioactive minerals for millennia, and this knowledge is not isolated to Aboriginal Australians. As Heather touched on, cases from across the world demonstrate that Indigenous peoples have had an historic relationship with nuclear substances for thousands of years. But even Australia's settler population has a longer history of interacting with nuclear materials than historians often give credit. In drawing together these two seemingly disparate threads in this paper, it's clear that the atom may have shaped much of history, especially in the last 80 years or so, but history has also shaped the atom as the mining of substances such as radium and uranium and the power they have unleashed were facilitated by scientific, imperial and settler colonial desires. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Okay, on to our scientists, please. Can we start with Floriana? Perfect. 
well, I hope you can uh, hear and see this. So, um, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to this event. In uh, my talk, I will give uh, a, a different perspective, scientific one. And in particular, I will be talking uh, about uh, how neutrons can help to rediscover uh, aspects uh, of the past by investigating uh, the material documentation uh, produced by ancient uh, civilization. I will start uh, just explaining briefly uh, what is neutron? Well, this can be uh, this, um, this can be explained by looking at uh, how coffee is made. So you are all familiar with uh, uh, medical X-ray, and now you are looking at uh, a uh, radiography that was taken using uh, uh, neutrons. Neutrons are uh, a subatomical particle. They are the building block of uh, the um, uh, atomic uh, nucleus. And they have a very interesting feature. So first of all, they have no charge, so they can penetrate easily through uh, dense material. In fact, in this uh, um, real-time radiography, you can see that the, uh, the metal wall of the uh, mocha appear quite transparent. At the same time, neutrons uh, are very sensitive uh, to light element. Um, and again, here you can see that uh, the plastic candle and water appears to be uh, very dark because they are up, um, contain hydrogen, which can absorb easily uh, neutrons. All these features make neutrons uh, an ideal probe to investigate matters in a non-invasive uh, uh, way, which is mandatory when we are dealing with uh, uh, artifacts uh, of historical uh, and cultural significance. However, uh, um, neutron is something that you cannot produce uh, uh, at home. Uh, you need a large scale facility, like for example, uh, ENSTO. ENSTO is Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization, is a landmark infrastructure which is the home of most of uh, the state of the art uh, capability and uh, uh, expertise. Uh, um, in Australia. And one of these is the Open Multipurpose Research Reactor. This is our source uh, of neutrons, and neutrons which are produced here are utilized by a suite of uh, instruments which are on, uh, managed by the Australian Centre for Neutron Scattering. In a typical uh, experiment analysis, uh, we illuminate the sample material uh, with the uh, beam of neutron and we look at all the neutrons that interact with the matters. So we can detect those neutrons which are transmitted through the material, or those who are absorbed, or uh, neutrons which are scattered uh, by the sample. And uh, uh, depending on which uh, uh, interaction me uh, mechanism we are looking at, this is defined as uh, a different uh, techniques. So here the message that I would like to give you is just uh, there are uh, different methods that can be utilized in tandem in order to survey the bulk, uh, the material bulk in a non-destructive way from the macroscopic to an uh, atomic uh, scale. Let's give you some example. One of these techniques is uh, neutron imaging. You have seen uh, in the first slides uh, the movie of the Mocha machine. That is uh, neutron imaging. So we illuminate the sample uh, with uh, our uh, uh, neutron beam and we record uh, the shadow that is cast by the object. But uh, uh, shadow is very informative because they carry information about the interior, uh, the composition and the inner structure. Uh, uh, of an item. When we collect the images um, from a different angle of the same object, we can computationally combine them to uh, reconstruct a 3D model that can be virtually uh, sliced without damaging uh, the actual, the original um, uh, item. 
There is also another uh, big group of uh, uh, techniques uh, which are defined as neutron diffraction. In this case, uh, we are looking at those neutrons which are scattered by uh, the uh, atom composing uh, the sample. And this can be used to uh, understand the composition of the material, but also all the material was treated, for example, uh, a bronze bracelet is found in archaeological site. We are able to tell the composition of that bracelet, but also if it was uh, cast or uh, cold or hot hammered, for example. All these techniques are uh, applied to uh, different uh, scientific research field. The application are just limited by imagination. And they are at the surface of Australian International Academia and Industry. And um, in case of non proprietary research, access to the facility is basically for free. If you are more curious about that, I will explain you uh, later on. Today, I will just now, I will just focus on application to uh, cultural heritage. So, application to cultural heritage material uh, um, are quite broad and they range from simple documentation to identification of uh, ancient manufacturing technology to evaluation of new conservation method and can be applied to a, a variety of different uh, uh, materials as well. So I will just offer you a uh, few case uh, studies as an example. So and I will start um, uh, from uh, uh, samurais arm and arm, in particular uh, from samurais uh, blade. Samurai's uh, sword uh, is very uh, particularly famous for uh, their aesthetical and also for uh, the mechanical feature. The making uh, um, is a very old uh, tradition and complex as well. It starts from uh, an uh, accurate refinement of the material that is uh, um, uh, shaped into a blade. Um, the, the feature uh, a um, presence of metal of slightly different composition. Uh, once the blade is formed, it also undergoes some specific uh, uh, thermal treatment uh, to give the desired aesthetical and mechanical feature. This is the basic uh, recipe. Well, we're starting from the uh, 10th, 11th century AD. A different tradition and school in Japan developed their own variation to this uh, uh, basic procedure. And those variations were kept as a sort of secret uh, that was transmitted only, only orally from the uh, master to his pupil. So in collaboration with the Museum of Applied Art and Sciences um, uh, in Sydney, we wanted to understand uh, better this uh, manufacturing process and uh, how they evolved during time. And we started from a, a, a small group of sample of sword, part of their collection. The interesting part of this collection is that some blades are known in for origin and provenance, uh, while others, uh, uh, they have no uh, known authorship. So you can see an example here, the first three are attributed, the last one is uh, of unknown uh, author. So we decide to um, develop, uh, to try uh, to conduct the first pilot study in order to combine all different uh, neutron uh, methods and try to characterize the, uh, the uh, manufacturing process uh, at the same time to develop a non-invasive approach to scientifically attribute unknown artifact. What we can tell with neutron tomography? So neutron tomography in this specific case uh, was able to give an insight uh, into the refinement of the metal that was used uh, in the production of this blade. So here you can see some cross section or the um, imaging reconstruction. So in dark gray is the metal, 
while the light gray corresponds to inclusion and the very whitish part to the presence of porosity. And this can be correlated to, to the uh, manufacturing process. We combine this information with the uh, diffraction map. I'm not going into scientific detail here. So what uh, I would like to tell you is that based on this diffraction map, we were able to uh, distinguish uh, the very early manufacturing process from a uh, later one. And uh, based on this uh, diagram, we were also able to say that uh, uh, the unknown sample uh, is a, a map which match uh, the one of the blade that was uh, uh, produced uh, in the early stage of Japanese uh, blade manufacture. Now we are also expanding this uh, project uh, and looking at those uh, blades that were produced uh, during World War II. At that time, uh, um, the officer, the Japanese of officer, had to wear a sword as part of the uniform. However, uh, the traditional knowledge of to produce blade was lost and had to be uh, reinvented. At the same time, there were soldiers uh, carrying uh, ancient blades inherited within the family and using them during uh, the war. So using our approach, we were able to identify traditional manufacture from uh, World War II manufacture. And the same very uh, approach can be also uh, applied to blade uh, from other civilizations. For example, uh, we are now studying the kingdom of Daume, present day uh, Benin, uh, that existed from the 17th to the 20th century when it was conquered by French. The interesting uh, uh, part uh, of this study is uh, um, the civilization uh, uh, were making was producing uh, uh, amazing uh, um, iron sword, but there is no iron source no in the region. So scholars uh, for a very long time have uh, always debated about uh, how much the extent uh, of European influence in the making of uh, weaponry in this area. Um, and uh, we apply our uh, um, combined uh, uh, neutron method in order to investigate a, a small batch of uh, uh, African uh, blade from the Kingdom of Naume uh, in collaboration with the University of Sydney and the private uh, collector. And we were able to gain a new insight in uh, uh, the production uh, or this um, uh, item, which are mostly uh, ritual. And our study seems to suggest uh, that, yes, there was uh, some European uh, influence, but most of the production seems to be uh, indigenous. Um, we are also studying uh, um, ritual uh, object, like for example, Tibetan Buddhist uh, statue in collaboration with the Museum of Applied Art and Sciences. When we, are, uh, we have investigated these two um, uh, Buddhist uh, uh, statue. Um, they are made of bronze, but they are hollow inside and filled with uh, uh, items of spiritual significance. For moral uh, and ethical reasons, we cannot uh, uh, open them and look inside, but uh, neutron imaging offers uh, a, a way uh, to know more about uh, this uh, item and uh, the um, uh, people they produce them. So for example, you are looking at uh, a cross-section uh, through the uh, 3D reconstruction on the stupa and you can see the presence of uh, a iron pole in the upper part and also the presence of some uh, rock tissue seeds as petal uh, and some other organic remains. In the other case uh, the um, neutron imaging were able to give us uh, more uh, information about the uh, production uh, the, uh, and also in past intervention uh, more recent intervention like for example this insert or uh, the addition of some uh, pins and uh, to highlight also the uh, ceramic core, which indicated the use of lost wax technique to uh, produce, to manufacture this uh, object. Uh, 
The final uh, case study I would like to show you is about um, uh, ancient Egypt. In collaboration with the Nicole Submission, we have been studying uh, animal mummy for, from their collection. So ancient Egyptian, uh, Egyptian were mummified not only human, but also uh, animals and um, for ritual uh, purpose, of course. And this was uh, done uh, at, uh, at some sort of industrial scale uh, uh, around the third century uh, BC. Mm, and uh, uh, these bundles were produced for all a range of uh, budget because of the economical value is not uncommon to find, find some fakes uh, even in missing collections. So the curator wanted to know more about the content of these uh, bundles. So we combine uh, uh, neutrons together with X-ray because it is uh, to probe for um, Complementary contrast, I want to allow different components in the same object. And here I will just uh, present uh, a, um, one example for all. Uh, and this bundle was the most interesting uh, since it highlighted the presence uh, of the uh, remains of the two ibises, uh, which is the uh, Thing, uh, uh, quite rare, uh, which doesn't make much of economical sense. And uh, investigation studying on uh, uh, this item is still undergoing. So all the um, investigation I've shown you today uh, about the Umbrella of the Cultural Heritage Project, uh, the time coordinating it also together with the Rachel White. And the aim of this project is to uh, facilitate uh, uh, and promote the access to all these, uh, not only neutron, but all nuclear techniques uh, available on site for the investigation of cultural heritage uh, materials. We are uh, currently um, involved in, in different uh, projects uh, across size and uh, in collaboration with different university uh, museums and also regional uh, owners. And uh, we are also um, pointing uh, at the uh, education of our uh, um, potential uh, users. Uh, in fact, uh, we are uh, um, about to organize the second edition of the Nuclear Techniques for Cultural Heritage, is a workshop where we showcase um, different neutral methods, and all those methods can be applied uh, to investigation of. Uh, heritage material and uh, uh, date will be announced uh, soon and it will be most likely uh, a virtual event. So all these uh, uh, studies that I have presented are not just my work, uh, but uh, the um, uh, result of collaboration with uh, uh, many people involved that I would like to thank and thank you for uh, uh, your kind attention today. Thank you, Floriana, and indeed, these are all very collaborative projects, I, I imagine. Thank you. And last but not least, over to Julia Carpenter to um, round out our presentations before question time. Thanks, Julia. Thank you. Um, and are you going to share my slides for me? Great. So I guess um, I'm going to talk today about another aspect of this, which is the environmental legacy of the nuclear weapons testing and the early uranium mining in Australia. And while I'm going to focus on the environmental impacts of this program, I really want to acknowledge that there are very significant human impacts as well that still continue today, particularly for the local Indigenous communities in these areas. So next slide. Um, the first site I'm going to talk about is the Rum Jungle Uranium Mine, uh, which provided uranium used to manufacture British nuclear weapons. This mine is located about 100 kilometres south of Darwin in the South Alligator Rivers region of the Northern Territory. It was opened in 1954 and it was one of Australia's first uranium mines, but it was also a very productive copper and gold mine. At the time the mine was operated, there were very few, if any, environmental controls in place, which meant that during mine operations, the tailings, which included radioactive materials, heavy metals and sulphur, as well as many other contaminants, often flooded into local rivers and floodplains. 
when the mine closed in 1971, it was abandoned. So the tailings remained on site. Um, there was no effort made to sort of contain them or cap them. And the contaminants continued to spread into the surrounding land and waterways with the tropical climate and high annual rainfall and monsoon seasons exacerbating the problems. Um, and the image, one of the images on this slide, you can see um, the green river, which is copper contamination from this mine. In the 1980s, radiation protection standards had been updated, which meant that the mine site was now officially recognised as being unsafe for people. So something had to be done about it. And the Commonwealth government funded a rehabilitation program, which uh, aimed to cap the tailings and prevent uh, future exposure and contamination. Uh, unfortunately, the remediation works were not as effective as they expected. So now more work needs to be done uh, to maintain the safety of the site. And, uh, Quite a lot of studies have been completed over the last 10 years to try and determine exactly what the problem is and come up with some solutions. Um, and since 2009, traditional owners have been working with the Northern Territory Government to design a new rehabilitation program, um, which is expected to cost at least $300 million, probably more, I, I would expect. Um, and when looking at the current contamination issues at Rum Jungle, it's really important to note that despite this mine being primarily known as uranium mine, radiation is not the most significant hazard at the site for either the people or the environment. Um, it's really the heavy metals and the toxic contaminants that are the, the big issue. And it's expected that by controlling these other hazards, the radiation hazards themselves will also be managed. However, the public perception is that radiation is the biggest hazard. And this is a really common theme in radiation protection, where you have this fear of an, an anxiety around radiation, uh, which can itself cause um, significant harm to people and their mental and physical health. Uh, we saw this uh, following the Fukushima accident, where there were some areas with very real radiation hazards and other areas with perceived radiation hazards, but the mental health impact on the populations was quite similar. Uh, next slide. The next site I want to talk about is the Montebello Islands, which were mentioned earlier. Um, they're a group of remote islands off the Pilbara coast of Western Australia. There were three nuclear detonations at Montebello during the early 1950s, two of these on land and one on boat. Uh, and this included the largest test ever carried out in Australia in terms of the yield of the test. Um, so since the 1960s, there have been regular site surveys to monitor the radiation levels. And these surveys have shown that the gamma radiation levels, which is the radiation you're uh, exposed to through your skin, um, just from being in the surrounding area, uh, these levels have been steadily decreasing over time. And that's what was expected due to radioactive decay and also natural processes um, with the tides and the, the sand moving around and mixing in. Due to the remoteness of the site and the fact that the radiation levels are continuing to decrease, there's actually been very little formal decontamination of these sites and they've mostly been left alone. Um, initially, some structures were removed um, and any visible metal fragments were removed to deter people taking them away as souvenirs. Uh, but really, uh, pretty much the only other thing is, that has been done is that areas of increased radioactivity are signposted uh, clearly at the, the places where you enter the site. And the islands are currently managed as a conservation reserve, which is uh, partially about restricting access and the islands are only accessible by boat. And the fact that these islands have been basically undisturbed for the last 60 years as well as um, their specific climate and oceanographic features, means that they now provide an excellent habitat for a really diverse range of biota. And this includes a number of threatened and endangered species. However, uh, in some of our more recent radiological surveys, it's been discovered that there are plutonium levels that are elevated in the soil, sea sediments, the beach sands, and in the biological tissues of wildlife. There's still much that's unknown about how this plutonium may impact local flora and fauna populations. And this is a growing, an area of growing scientific research. And the impact is really through um, ingestion uh, of the contaminated sands and waters. I think it's, um, it's fair to say that in the past, the studies at Montebello were focused solely on the protection of human health. 
Whereas now the key questions are related to the dose rates and the potential effects to threatened and endangered species. So this is um, quite a shift in the focus of both the radiation surveys and the scientific work that's being done there. We haven't seen any negative effects on population at a population level on species so far. Um, but one example is that there are sea turtles that use contaminated beaches for nesting. So they're definitely being exposed. And this is an area where there's likely to be further study. Future management of the sites is, is going to need to balance the radiation exposure concerns uh, with other concerns for wildlife conservation and the need to protect the habitats of these species, um, as well as a potential increase in tourism and other industries. Uh, next slide. So now I'm going to move on to Maralinga, which is probably the most well known of Australia's legacy sites. Uh, as you heard earlier, Mount Erlinga was the location of seven atomic detonations, which were known as major trials, but also hundreds of safety tests on minor trials. And it's these minor trials which were much more experimental. Um, they were looking at different ways of blowing things up, <laughs> uh, basically, um, and they caused the most long-term environmental harm. Uh, because they dispersed highly radioactive and long-lived contamination to the local environment, ranging in size from uh, tiny inhalable particles in dust, to quite large metal fragments that you could, you could pick up and walk away with. And there's so much that could be said about Maralinga, um, but I'm really gonna focus on the cleanup criteria, uh, and this is the Australian cleanup. So the, initially there was a British cleanup uh, that was done without any oversight from Australian scientists or politicians. Um, as, but following a Royal Commission in 1984, which you also heard about earlier, uh, it was decided that an Australian cleanup was needed. So a technical assessment group known as the TAG was established and their initial task was to conduct a whole series of technical assessments to determine the nature of the hazard at Maralinga. And this included aerial and ground surveys to uh, look at the range of the contamination and then field and laboratory studies which investigated all the other things you need to know to do a really thorough dose assessment. So these are things like uh, looking at the particle size distributions uh, of the contaminated particles and whether they were at a size where you could actually breathe them in and they would stay in your lungs or not. Uh, looking at the dust loading, so for the different activities on the site, how much dust was in the air and how much radioactivity was in that dust. How the contaminants interact with the environment and transfer into plants and animals and uh, in particular bush foods and uh, animals that might have been hunted. And there was also a detailed anthropological study to look at the lifestyle, diet and habits of the local population. So all of this fed into a quite detailed radiation risk assessment. Um, and that was looking at the risk uh, from the site under a range of scenarios. At this point, the local Indigenous people, the Maralinga Jaritsha, were involved in the process uh, both formally through a cons uh, Maralinga consulta consultative group um, but also informally through interactions with the scientists working on the site. Um, and I guess these relationships depend on the people involved, but I know some of the people I work with today still talk really positively about these relationships that they managed to build. Uh, and, and they were quite valued relationships and they felt that they really benefited the project. A key issue at this point was finding a balance between minimizing the radiation exposure to the people uh, and further destroying the land. So as you can see from the aerial photo on this slide, soil removal, um, which is required to completely remove contamination, can cause significant lasting damage to the land, which we can still see today. Um, and the revegetation is, it, it's a really slow process. The strong feedback uh, that was received from the Maryland Gajaritra was that complete removal of vegetation and soil should be avoided because of this damage. So the preferred option was to only remove the soil in the areas of highest contamination. In the remaining contaminated area, uh, metal fragments and other detectable contamination was removed where possible. Uh, and the area was designated for restricted use as a non-residential area, which means that it's safe for hunting and passing through, but not for camping or permanent residence. Um, and there are some points I'd like to make about the remediation and how the site is now. So the first point I wanna make is that the remediation at Maralinga has been successful in that it continues to meet the radiation protection and site access criteria that were agreed at the beginning of the project. And there are recent dose assessments that confirm this and there's an ongoing commitment to keep doing these dose assessments uh, over time. 
Secondly, since the cleanup, radiation protection standards have continued to evolve. Legacy sites like Maralinga are now classified as existing exposure situations, and there's a whole international framework uh, which we've incorporated into the Australian uh, Radiation Protection Program that talks about how these sites should be managed. Uh, and it's quite reassuring to see that the work that was done at Maralinga and also at Montebello fits within this framework. So the site still meets the standards that would be expected if the cleanup were to be done today. And finally, um, for any long and complex project like this, uh, which is done on a huge scale, there will be aspects that do not proceed as expected. Um, not everything went to plan at Marilinga, and there are lots of people who will be able to point out flaws in the process. Um, but just because some things go wrong, it doesn't mean that the project itself is a failure. So the result from a radiation protection perspective is that we started with a site that was unsafe. Um, and there was actually a real possibility that someone could inadvertently come across enough plutonium to kill them. Um, and now we have a site that is in a condition that allows the Marilinga Jarretcher to safely use the majority of the land in the way they want to. And this continues to be an ongoing process and we still, uh, our Panzer still runs regular forums with the local people to uh, talk about what was done in the past and to maintain the, the knowledge both within our Panza and with the Maralinga uh, Jarretcher elders. Uh, so the next lesson, uh, the next slide, sorry. I'm gonna talk about um, some of the lessons we've learned from managing these sites uh, and also some other sites over the last 50 years. So firstly, um, I don't think many people disagree that we should be doing everything we can to avoid creating legacy sites in the future. Uh, in the 1950s, there was pretty much no regulation oversight uh, with respect to protecting the environment from radiation hazards. And the approach was very much that if people are protected, then the environment will also be protected. And it's now accepted that this is not true. There's an expectation now that radiation protection of the environment needs to be demonstrated independently of radiation protection of people. So just showing that people are protected isn't enough to approve uh, something going ahead. Additionally, it's part of our Panzer's regulatory requirements that planning and funding for decommissioning and rehabilitation of a site needs to be considered and planned for before a construction or operation license will be approved. Uh, and this is one of the things we have in place to try and prevent these types of situations occurring again. But of course, it's not only um, sites related to radiation where this is a problem. Um, almost any activity we do can have an environmental impact that we should be thinking about. Secondly, um, no remediation project is going to have a perfect outcome. And we know even before we start that this is the case. Uh, the process of remediation can also damage the land. So there's a need to find a balance of, of a whole lot of different risks. So we need to be quite pragmatic and realistic about the problem. We need to be clear and open with anyone who's interested about the evidence base that sits behind the proposed options. And this has to include uncertainties and unknowns because there are always uncertainties and unknowns and things are gonna pop up uh, as we start. And we need to weigh up the social, economic, political and environmental concerns to try and optimize the end result. Even the best, most well-planned remediation is not going, always gonna be successful. And that's why it's really important to have uh, plans for long-term management and monitoring, uh, and also to try and maintain the corporate knowledge of remediation programs over time in case we need to uh, come back to them again. Um, obviously, stakeholder engagement is critical throughout the entire process. Good stakeholder engagement makes it more likely that projects will meet the wants and the needs of the most impacted communities. And it helps local knowledge uh, to be shared and built into the project to get the best outcomes. Um, and this, this is also really important with radiation because despite the technical difficulties that you sometimes see, our biggest challenge is often risk perception and having that conversation about how much protection is enough protection. Uh, and when, when you start to get to the point where you can put in a whole lot more time and money for very minimal output. Uh, and I guess that touches on the point that good quality protection and remediation takes time and it costs a lot of money. If we put off and delay these issues even longer, leaving them to deal with in the future, the result is often a more challenging task that costs more when the time comes to deal with it. So if we have the resources and the technical capabilities to manage these sites now, 
we should try and do it now rather than leaving problems for future generations. And so just to leave you with one final thought um, that's related to the topic we're talking today, um, these lessons are also very relevant to radioactive waste disposal. And this is an issue that's being debated right now in Australia. Um, the social, political and environmental difficulties related to waste disposal are not going to go away and they're not going to get easier with time. Um, we, despite the debate about whether we should be producing radioactive waste or not, um, the fact is that Australia has radioactive waste that's been produced in the past. So it's really important that we find a way as a community to move forward with this issue and safely and fairly manage the radioactive waste we have in Australia. So thank you for listening to me today and I'm looking forward to the questions we're all going to get. Thank you so much, uh, Julia, and thank you to our four presenters. Um, I found the papers really stimulating and fascinating and also it's just some really um, some great synergies across all the papers, um, some unexpected connections, um, thinking of themes of um, ways of knowing and searching for knowledges, whether it's through testing or um, exploration or diffraction, um, but also um, the ways that um, I guess fear of, of nuclear technologies or fascination in nuclear technologies has, has overshadowed um, some other real threats to the environment, to health and to longer histories of colonialism. Um, so thank you, uh, all four of you. Now we're, we're now going to open up for questions and the way we're going to do it is um, through the chat. Um, so this is not the, the Q&A button, the chat button, uh, just near the bottom. Um, so if anyone who has any questions could, sorry, um, could type a question in the chat and I will raise the question for the panellists. Uh, you can direct your question generally to all four panellists or uh, to someone in particular. Uh, and we've got one already from a teacher. Uh, so is the exposure to nuclear radiation and particulate matter what decreases resistance to disease or is it human contact on Heather's point about disease like measles? Does that make sense? I'm not sure I read it very clearly. I think that's a question for, for Heather, um, but maybe also for Julia. Oh, Heather, you're, you're muted. Um, I'm not sure if that first question um, is, um, I mean, I, I think the, the, the first question is not uh, one that I'm particularly able to answer, except that I think there's, it, it's important to understand the difference between a viral infection, a bacterial infection, and the impact of radiation. Um, and, and Julia and uh, Floriana will be able to explain the impacts, um, the negative impacts and the damage that radiation can do. Um, whereas, the, I mean, a, a viral infection and a bacterial infection are different things. They're different organisms and they require to be, uh, they require treatment in different sorts of ways medically. Um, so they're not necessarily the same situation at all. But my, one of the things I'd point out is that this the, the impact and the very, um, the, the quite close in time impact of uh, the diseases which had come with European colonization at the same time that people may have been impacted by uh, other problems arising from the nuclear testing. Um, they may well have had their immune system weakened um, by the, the massive health assaults that they'd had from infections from viruses or bacteria, um, which would have left them in a weakened state to deal with other pressures um, and other challenges. But I'm, you know, I mean, it's very difficult to tell that because there was so little medical attention to Indigenous people's health in the Pindijara and Yankundijara lands, there was just no baseline. Nobody had done this properly. Charles Duguid had a crack at it, but there was just so little information that it was extremely difficult uh, to, to assess the impact of the nuclear testing because nobody had bothered to assess the impact of anything else that was happening. I, I can add to that with the health impacts of radiation. So there are two sort of categories of health impact from radiation. You have your deterministic effects, which 
are what you see when you have a really high exposure to radiation generally over a short time. Um, so that can be things like skin burns, um, you can lose your hair, if you get enough it affects your bone marrow and you can die. Um, but you also have stochastic effects to radiation and this is sort of the, the slow, gradual, long-term effects where you can have an increased risk of cancer 20 or 30 years down, down the line. Uh, and this can be a cumulative effect. And there's, because we have such a high natural incidence of cancer, it's really hard to determine at what point that radiation exposure starts to increase your risk. So we try to apply a bit of a precautionary approach about it. And the idea is to minimize your exposure as much as you can. Um, there is natural exposure, to, there's radiation in all soil and rocks uh, coming from space. So you can never have zero exposure to radiation and you can't measure all exposure to radiation because of that background. Um, so it's really about minimizing it. Um, and different types of radiation exposure will affect you differently. So if you have inhaled uh, something that sits in your lung for a long time, that's different to if you walk past something uh, and, and you get a bit going through your body. Um, so in really simple terms, that, that's the best to explain it. Could I, could I just add that if we think about the period of time in which the nuclear British nuclear tests were occurring in Australia, it's important to understand that those extremely sensible uh, standards and protocols that Julia has just described to you have been the result of long observation of, for example, the people who are exposed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. At, in the 19 period from 1952 through to 1958 and 63, there was very little knowledge and there was an assumption that by uh, British and the United States scientists that they had answers to these problems when it became increasingly obvious that there weren't answers. Things that they were expecting were not happening or things were happening much more rapidly or so there was it, it, it I think that decade really brought home the need for humility and many scientists took that up very seriously mm -hmm. but in the early years of the 1950s there was a, a great confidence among some of the people who were associated with the scientific uh, groups in Australia from Britain and from the United States as well as Australians that that they had the answers and that people shouldn't be raising doubts because this was um, this was not patriotic. Um, so there's a there's another question for me there about uh, nuclear testing and colonialism but I, I'll answer that in a minute. Somebody else wants to have a response. Well, apart from the, the question from Angela about colonialism, there's the, um, uh, a question about Maralinga, which it might also be for you, Heather. Um, Mick writes, Maralinga signage notes in language and icons that hunting is okay, but camp is not. However, on several site visits, I've encountered numerous large rabbit burrows at ground zeroes and barrel pits. One of, oh dear, two, for you, um, and other alpha emitters being ingested um, by empty community. And should signs warn not to hunt, cook, eat fauna, and it's, is uptake into flora an issue at such locations? That's really uh, a question for Julia, that, right? Yeah, it's probably for Julia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the latest dose assessment that was done at Maralinga was in 2011, and it took into account uh, the habits of the local community. So it includes consideration of uh, ingesting contaminated animals, basically. So. So those things are considered in the dose assessments that are done and in the recommendations that are made uh, to both the government and the local communities. Uh, in uh, 2019, I think was the most recent um, forum we did at Maralinga where people went outside and we spent three days um, at Maralinga talking to the local, local communities. And these are the kinds of things we talk about. So how they want to use the site, how they actually are using the site. Um, so that when we do update dose assessments, we can account for these factors. So yes, they are considered. Okay. It, and we, I, we might go on to that question from, from Angela. Yeah, uh, 
about nuclear colonialism, but also Jess might have some comments on that. So Angela asks, um, it's especially striking that you brought in China's 1964 test and the league is into the picture. Does this align with the contempt and neglect noted, um, especially in South Australia and Nevada, or does it bring in different aspects uh, to imperial control? So the reason that I think it's important to, if you look at India as well and at the Soviet Union, um, you are not necessarily dealing with the lands of indigenous peoples in, in each situation. The lands that are used for nuclear testing are lands which were identified as wastelands. So there's it, it, invariably in this period, the 40s, 50s and 60s, very little appreciation of environmental um, the importance of either vegetation or wildlife or space generally. Um, so the, the areas that are, are used for testing are areas which are not um, ex useful for Western style agriculture largely. Um, and they're often labeled quite explicitly as wastelands, but often they are the only places where indigenous colonized people or people who are marginalized by the power structures of those states are able to have any security. And the reason that I wanted to raise the Uyghurs and the, the issue of China as well as to um, uh, point to India and the Soviet Union is that the, the states which were testing nuclear weapons were looking at places where people that they held in contempt um, had been able to find some sort of security. Now, in many areas, they were indigenous colonized people, and there's a whole range of meanings to space and landscape that, that may not have been the case with more recently displaced people who might have found security there. But nevertheless, the questions about um, the, the, the power structures of states, those states which were testing nuclear weapons, um, they were invariably seeking lands which they didn't want to use economically at that stage, and the lands of people who were regarded as disempowered, whether they were indigenous colonized peoples or whether they were marginalized migrant groups or uh, it, long established marginalized groups, religiously or culturally or, or uh, racially. Uh, Maggie Brady raised her hand. Um, Maggie, did you have a question? Um, well, yes, I, I actually just had a few contributions, really, um, to follow up on some of the things that have been said, if, if that's all right. Um, I guess just to follow up on the question about um, the Maralinga signage and the hunting from Mick, I think you need to remember that um, the people who live in the vicinity of Maralinga, the Oak Valley um, community, the outstation, as it were, to the west, have been aware for the last uh, 25, 30 years about what's been going on at Maralinga and we're involved in all the cleanups and the studies and so on in, that I've been working with. So they're very, you know, they they know about the, the dangers of hunting and obtaining food resources in various places and um, and they're you know so there are two things to say there first of all they make sure that they um, hunt to, further to the west or they go down to the plain and get rabbits and other uh, foods that are available there and the other thing to, to mention is that um, sadly perhaps these days um, hunting is less engaged in partly because of the new um, licensing regulations about access to rifles and also um, new health and safety rules about who can travel in the back of utes and so on. So the, the kind of level of use of the country has diminished in the last 30 years. So despite the fact people are actually living at Oak Valley, I'm afraid they're not using the country as much as they used to. Um, but I also just wanted to say that I thought it was interesting that a couple of different speakers have raised the issue of the, the problem, if you like, of the public perception that radiation is the most damaging um, hazard to do with the issues we've been talking about when I think that um, certainly in the case of the people I know, uh, Maralinga, um, you know, there are other 
long term um, aspects to their lives that have been, you know, that have damaged them, that are peripheral. You know, they're not directly related to radiation exposure. Um, they are issues such as um, the dislocation from the land. So, you know, they were not exposed to radiation because they were nearly all um, by that stage um, further south at Yalata. Um, but the poisoning of the lands and their exclusion from those lands have had long term health and cultural impacts on those people. So the radiation itself is, is kind of, you know, just one aspect of that. And I think that it's, a, it's, I think that the public panic about radiation tends to mask these other issues. And the other issues that it masks that Heather raised is measles and the long-term impact of measles. And the other thing I was going to mention is just that there's some very interesting new medical research come out in 2019 about exposure to measles in virgin populations actually having devastating and long-term effects on people's immune systems. In fact, they now know that measles in a virgin population can wipe out people's antibodies, making them vulnerable to all sorts of other infections. And I think this puts what happened to Aboriginal people at Wallatina and in fact at Yalata and at Aldia in a, in a new light because it means that they were made very much more vulnerable to all the other um, insults, if you like, that have descended upon them. So if anybody's got any other follow up comments, I'd be interested to hear from them. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Maggie. Um, now we we do have, we are out of time, I'm sorry everyone, but we do actually have a couple more questions. So if you bear with us, but we understand if people, if people have to go. Um, there's a few questions that have come through uh, for Floriana. Uh, in particular, Ned has asked um, if, this, uh, if your work can be applied in South Pacific regions and uh, is there experience with the Philippines. Uh, on that, Julia also asks uh, if there's an exciting discovery or object from the past that's been revealed by neutron diffracting, uh, diffraction technology. And I'm actually going to add on a third kind of question or comment. Um, what some of the exciting stuff about your research, well, that I found exciting was the way that it's focused on not just non-destruction of objects. Um, but how does that, so much of what we've talked about today is to do with place and location and indigenous knowledge is embedded in the landscape. Um, you mentioned briefly rock art at the end. Uh, how portable is this technology? Um, can it be taken to different places? And uh, is the removal of objects from place um, can that be incorporated in this non-destructive framework? So, well, thank you for uh, your yes, question. Sorry, <laughs> a few questions. Uh, so maybe I will start uh, from the... Uh, the question the about the Pacific and the Philippines? Yeah, yes. So, um, well, personally, uh, I have been working on uh, uh, some items uh, uh, from um, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, so again, they are uh, uh, weapons because, uh, um, well, neutrons, uh, uh, I'm specialized in neutrons technique. So in uh, um, the material of election to be investigated with these uh, uh, techniques is uh, most of the time metal. So because other probes are not able to penetrate the deep into the bulk or this uh, uh, dense material. So neutron offered a way um, to investigate this object uh, uh, without uh, cutting uh, them apart. So yes, we can apply uh, neutron methods to uh, antiquity for, from that region. And I haven't worked specifically on Philippines. So, um, but this really depend on what kind of material you want to investigate and what kind of uh, uh, answer you are seeking. So, because sometimes neutrons are not well suited uh, to investigate uh, a particular uh, material or are not able to provide a, a certain type of uh, answer. Uh, 
So, but the good thing uh, at Amstel is that uh, we have uh, a wide range of uh, different equipment uh, that can be uh, used uh, uh, in a multi-technique approach uh, in order to uh, extract the uh, most of the information out of uh, an uh, investigation uh, campaign. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, new, uh, nuclear activation analysis can be uh, applied to investigate provenance of uh, uh, ancient uh, hopes uh, pigment. Uh, in that case, uh, uh, neutron techniques are not really helpful, so we need a different kind uh, of uh, techniques. So it's something that has to be evaluated uh, case by case. Uh, but the towns we are uh, open, so we are uh, yeah, all the question, uh, we welcome all the sort of uh, uh, inquiry. And uh, there are a lot of experts uh, which are uh, uh, always willing uh, uh, to uh, collaborate uh, um, with the scientists, uh, from, uh, with academia, from other. In, uh, institution, but also with uh, uh, with the public. Uh, so, for example, recently uh, I had an inquiry from a private collector uh, to collaborate together on investigation on uh, Japanese or the part of his collection. So, um, yeah, if uh, uh, you have any specific uh, uh, question that you want to answer uh, and a particular item that you want to investigate. Uh, probably we have uh, the right tool uh, uh, to uh, solve uh, uh, yeah, the, the problem, let's say. So, and uh, the second question is about uh, the most surprising discovery uh, in an object from the past. Uh, well, difficult question. <laughs> so there are um, actually uh, many uh, applications of uh, uh, new technique uh, to item of uh, uh, a cultural heritage object of uh, a different kind, not only uh, in Australia, but um, uh, the facility uh, that is present in Australia. And so we have um, there are equivalent also in Europe, in America, uh, in, um, in Japan, China, South Africa. So, and uh, they are all uh, um, working uh, mostly on the investigation of uh, uh, items uh, which are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, available through a connection to a local uh, museum or local university. So in uh, uh, my, uh, let's say, personal journey in uh, uh, the um, application of uh, neutron techniques, uh, I am the study that I enjoyed most was uh, on uh, a Japanese helmet from the uh, 17th century. Um, uh, and uh, we were able to uh, discover uh, a uh, structure or a way of uh, making this helmet that was uh, never reported in literature before. So it was uh, uh, the uh, first study of this kind. So, and yeah, for me, it was uh, really um, yeah, amazing uh, to, uh, yeah, to see this and uh, yeah, discover uh, uh, this. But yeah, as I say, there are so many other uh, studies going on there uh, on yeah, amazing uh, items. So it's really uh, blow drawing sometimes. It's really difficult to, to make uh, at least uh, uh, a, top, uh, a first one. So, and um, uh, then about uh, the last question that uh, uh, Laura. Uh, uh, that was my, yeah, my question about um, yeah, like portability. portability and keeping items in place. Oh, well, that's difficult <laughs> because uh, uh, unfortunately, um, well, the items have to be brought uh, on site. So, and um, um, I, um, well, in one of my slides, uh, I show um, rock heart. So there is a, a, 
big, huge project. Um, then in, uh, um, this is done uh, uh, mostly uh, using uh, um, dating techniques. So ion beam and yeah, basically ion beam analysis. So in, uh, um, in this case, uh, you uh, need to, to take a sample um, and then to bring the sample to the laboratory. But um, we are um, uh, most of the time working on uh, minimizing the impact of this uh, uh, sampling action. And uh, for example, uh, the uh, Center for Accelerator Science where uh, these uh, dating analyses are conducted is uh, a world uh, leader in uh, um, developing a protocol which need a microgram of uh, uh, samples to give uh, a date. So even if the techniques is not portable, so there are a strategy in place to work together with the, the Aboriginal owners. So they, uh, I mean, all these projects uh, are done. Uh, so uh, yeah, after uh, um, asking permission and collaboration with the Aboriginal owners, at the same time, uh, they're also minimizing uh, uh, so the uh, um, impact of this investigation campaign. So I, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, most of the techniques uh, uh, can only brought uh, to the museum or uh, uh, to an archaeological uh, site. So for example, in the case of uh, neutron techniques, we need uh, a uh, nuclear reactor. Uh, that's our source. So there's something that uh, at the moment is not really portable. There are a study, there, are, there is a research uh, going on trying to uh, make uh, a neutron source something portable, but uh, it's still at the early stage. Thank you so much, Lauren. And look, we're, we're going to have to leave it there. I can see everyone's contributing to the chat. Thank you to everyone who's taking part in that discussion there. But um, thank you especially to our, our four panels today. I really appreciate um, yeah, really fascinating papers with really interesting synergies. Great to be here. Nice to meet you all. I'm hoping to keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. everyone. Stay tuned for our next seminar. <laughs> we'll promote that accordingly. Bye. Bye.